Okay, John Sutton Flint Napping. We're back to another one. It's another rock, black rock I had, and I'm trying to knock all the stuff off of it. it had a bad crack across the off like three inches of what crack was, and trying to get the cortex off. So anyway, I don't hardly ever use Big Bertha, but I'm gonna have to get her out. See if I can save me some width on this thing. Run some flakes all the way across. Gotta so shoot them all the way across there. Hit them all the way across to there. Boy, that crack in this piece. Sure did mess it up. It's been about two inches longer and a heck of a lot wider. I have lost me some. I'm not gonna use this big thing no more. It's too hard. It did the job, you saw what it did, but it's just too hard for me to control it. I'm gonna drop back down this side, fixing my hand better. And I'm gonna try to run this one all the way into there. Like that right there. And I'll probably make this the point if I can get it out. It won't matter how much uh, width I'm losing down here because it's going to be the point anyway. I'll just come on down here and work on some stuff real quick, right? going to be a series I'm doing on using Dan Collins' uh, indirect percussion stick he's designed. And I'll hear him call it the snickle frizz and the wonder tool and the woolly booger and the cracker jack. All them things, man. It's better than Wonder Woman. That's good. Something can beat Wonder Woman. That's real good. All right, I got a, a big old, this, is, this isn't a blackhead or a whitehead, this is a cyst right here. I got a Lancer thing. I got to figure out some kind of way. The reason I said that, I was gonna say hickey. Every time somebody says hickey, that's what I think about, is a pimple. I'm gonna hit on top, straight down, Knock that out real quick. Do the same thing over here. Get this one out. There we go. I'm about ready for some uh, indirect. This is going to be my point, so I'm probably going to shorten this up a little bit. So it'll basically be a little wider. I'm not sure exactly what type of point I'm going to make out of this. Probably a dovetail. Might even make a clover side of it. Now, make it too thin for a clover. Wouldn't be for a fulsome, but it would be for a clover. Fulsome ain't this big, so anyway. There's some guys out there, and I'm working too, I ain't, I ain't against that. Especially, I, all my knives made out of flats because I make them out of obsidian. And I try to, to uh, obsidian's so expensive. I don't want to waste no material. But uh, what I fix to say is some guys out there that can probably make a clovis as thin as I'm making this out of a slab. And the slab ain't gonna have no highs and lows in it. It's gonna be perfect to start with. And you just gotta get a medium ridge down the middle of it. I like working slab with pressure flaking knife. Kind of fun. 
Get born when you got a lot of them to do. Sure can make a pretty pattern on them. A pretty, 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 pretty. <clears throat> My pretty P U R D Y. Like a pretty paintbrush. Okay, we're gonna come right in here. Knock the woolly bugger out of that, but I'm hit it. Got a bad place right there, and I don't know what to do with that. I think if I can come right in here. Thick platform right there. Grind it good. Come back and left field. Hit right there and take it out. That worked good. Okay. I'm going to stop this and start it over. I'm going to get rigged up for the indirect, buddy. Okay. We're back to... Uh, Indirect percussion. This thing's better than a veggie mat. You need to get one of these while it's on sale for Christmas. You get a special. You buy one, but that's not all. We'll also get a gift wrap box that comes in for $38.95, but that's not all. For additional $38.95, you'll get two of them. And for additional $38.95, you get three of them in free shipping. Boy, that damn Colin is running a good special for Christmas holiday. Cat, what are you doing in there? I don't think I got no mice in here. What are you doing, cat? You need to go catch a chipmunk. There's plenty of them around. If you see me using uh, this thing here and going back and using this, I'm just experimenting. I'm, this is all new to me, and I'm learning this stuff and different weights and different sizes and different lengths. The longer it is, the more speed you're going to have in your swing when the tip gets there. I am experimenting and hope you're watching and giving me your time to maybe help you out with stuff. I need somebody to help me out sometime. Okay. I'll do some more thinning out right here. Now hit that that way. I'm hitting this way. Cause I don't want it to uh, take my point out. Shoot across and uh, overshoot it and lose my point. 
Those are just, just starting over shooting. I mean, the plate goes all the way across the thing, it just like cuts it off. It's like you took a pair of scissors and snapped your point off. You don't do that. If I'm hitting it this way, it can run all the way up through here. It's not going to do that. plate. See how long that plate is? That's what I'm talking about. Look at this plate. See how long it is? If that one across there, it would have been cut off right there. And all I got to do is get a real sharp tool and pressure flake that baby out. There we go. I got a crack in the middle of this rock. And I noticed that when I was doing a uh, 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 direct percussion, it was on the side, and I thought I got out of it. It was way out here, and I thought I got out of it. When I got real deep right in here, and all of a sudden it like it popped back up at me like, what's that thing kids used to hit with a hammer and they pop, they pop up everywhere? I don't know what's it to I know one of mine had it one time, but they were little and they thought it was funny playing with that thing. We're going to find out right now how bad this crack is because I'm going to run this one right into it here. Get it set just right, right there. Yeah, it run right to it and stop. That's what I was afraid of. It is a crack. Maybe it won't break in half. It's not a hinge. It's just hurting the thinning process right in there. They're going to risk trying to thin it. I was worried about trying to thin that with a crack up above it a little way. Afraid it put too much spring vibration like this. I tried to support it best I could, and I guess I got lucky it didn't break. I'm gonna try this side now and try to do the same thing. I'm sure afraid it's gonna break in half. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Woo-wee. Man, I got lucky on that. 
That's something held together. I don't know if I'll make this several part video or tie it all in together. But if I tie it all in together, you'll know that I was running like a, talking like a chicken with his head running around. I was feeling good on my outside and went and got a bunch of rocks. I'm all excited and holiday, good church service this morning. I'm just on cloud nine. I'm just a rambling. When I'm happy, I ramble. When I'm mad or sad, I'm quiet. I like to be happy. I'll tell you what. I ain't gonna give it here because and get more lever action on it more speed i think that was a good choice it drove that a long way i don't believe that short one would have done that i'm not trying to take these that far i'm just tapping the working on the deltas on that kind of locking them off and if you just started watching and I didn't combine these videos and, and you're wondering, I think I said when I started this one, I'm experimenting with different ones. This one's short and heavy and this one's long and heavy, but the long one has more speed to it. When you come down, it's like popping a whip, you got a snap to it. And uh, I'm trying to see which one works the best. And when I don't want to move much much material a long way, I use that short one there. That's what I'm finding out. But when I want to drive it across like that, I use this one. The odds of breaking it with this one a lot more, but I'm not as accurate with what I'm doing. It's heavier and it's more bulky than it is with this one. And uh I don't know if I'm going to continue now. I don't know if y'all know if I'm rocking back and forth, but I'm hurting on my side. You know, there's nothing to be concerned about. It's a fact that I uh, picked up so much friggin' rock last but a couple of days ago. I'm not used to picking up that much rock. Several thousand pounds, and I'm sore. My muscles are sore. And I'm bending over, my muscles in there from picking them buckets up are hurting. And they're cramping on me. And that ain't fun when they do that. Woo, I'm hurt. Man, I got a stretch. Telling me that I'm too old to pick up a lot of rock. When I was in my 40s, late 30s, mid 30s, I would drive 10 to 12 hours to Texas where I was going, depending on where I was going, it was all up in the hill country. Some of it was 10 hours, some was 12. I can make it to Fredericksburg in about nine now. Fredericksburg used to be 10 hours. And uh, I leave early in the morning. I mean early, I'm talking about three o'clock or four o'clock in the morning. And I'd get there and I'd pick up rocks with flat dark. Five gallon buckets. Fill up two buckets and pack them out of the creek bank and dump them on the road. Pack them out of the creek bank, dump them on the road. Big old pile. And then that evening when it got dark, I didn't worry about getting them because it was a fenced in road. It was on a friend of mine's private ranch. <clears throat> and 
The next morning, I'd get on as soon as it got daylight. I mean, breaking daylight. And I'd pick them up and pack them out on the road. Pick them up and pack them out on the road all day long. And I would use a five-gallon bucket just for my scale. If you don't have any way of weighing stuff and, and like that, and you don't want to get your truck real overloaded, and you're worried and think, well, maybe I can haul more, maybe I can't. Take that particular rock and weigh it on the scale the first time you go. See, I was going out there two or three times a year. And you'll know how full to get that bucket. For it to weigh 50 pounds. 40 pounds is 2,000. 40 buckets, I mean, is 2,000 pounds at 50 pounds a bucket. And I could haul on my half-ton truck 2,000 pounds without no problem. Don't want to haul no more. But I might be a couple hundred off, but that's going to be okay. Now, I knew exactly how high to fill that bucket. Some buckets didn't have that much in it, and some I didn't fill that high, but I never did fill it higher than that. And I don't think I hardly ever got exactly 2,000 pounds. I probably had around a couple, couple hundred pounds short every time, maybe up to 500 pounds. But anyway, and what I'm telling you is I would get my truck about 3 o'clock that evening, and I'd drive down his road along the riverbank, and I'd pick my rocks up and dump them in the back of that truck. And I would hit the road. Take me about an hour and a half, two hours to do that. I'd be on the road by five, five o'clock. And I would drive sometimes all night home. And sometimes I'd stop at a friend's house. As soon as I got into Louisiana, which was about another six hours from my house. And I'd get up next morning and drive home. By myself, I do that at least three times a year, sometimes four times a year, because I was making a lot of stuff, and I was selling a lot of rock. And I did that for a long time. I mean, a long time. I had several friends. I had like eight ranchers in Texas that I could go, that had Pernalis River going right through the middle of them, or a creek that run into the Pernalis River that I could go on. Anytime I wanted to. They were friends of mine. We've become good friends over the years. I knew the children. The children were friends of mine. And uh, I had it made in Texas. And then, in Tennessee, I had Rex Moore. And I trained Rex Moore. Rex Moore didn't know he could make an arrow here. Somebody found a point in the Tennessee River, and I was with Hal Clark, and Hal said, let's go look at it. And we drove from Hal's house there, and Rex Moore and about other, eight other people that looking at that point. If I remember right, it might have been a Benton. And Hal told him I could make one. Now, I don't know how long ago this is. Hal might could tell you if it was in the 80s or early 90s. But it was a long time ago, and they didn't believe me. And so I got my frame out of points, went in my truck, and showed them stuff I made, and they still didn't believe me. So anyway, they followed me up to house, Clark, Al Clark's house, and I made a point for them. And those guys were standing there, and Rex Moore got my phone number. And a few days later, he called me. He said he wanted to come down to Natchez and visit with me. And I said, okay. And we got to discussion. He said, what are you doing up here with Hal? And I said, Hal told me he could help me find some flint. And I met Hal at a, at a, a, a festival they had in Tennessee at Pinson Mound. And I was doing demonstrating flint napping. And Hal wanted to learn how, and I told him I'd help teach him. So then... Mr. Moore decided to tell me that he's an artifact collector 
And he's been all up and down different people. I'm not going to tell you who, ranchers. He did have permission, but some of them I still don't about know who it was because I go in there sometimes. And I uh, picked up Arrowhead, looking for Arrowhead, but it was Flint there. And I said, are you serious? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, you know what? I said, if you'd like to go in the business of selling rock, I said, that's what I do. And I do pretty good at selling rock. I said, I can help you get started if you have time. He said, I have a job. He said, I have free time. And he said, I'm always wanting to make money. So I got Rex Moore started. I literally went up there, Jerry, let me tell you this, and stayed a couple of days up there and helped him grade it and showed him what was good and what was bad and walked the creeks with him and some of the creeks. And the ones I walked with them don't have much on them right now. And the people that own them but sold land, and I don't know if anybody can get on them now, but, but some of them are still, you know, still okay. You still get on them. But, uh, Anyway, I would say, Rex, that right, right there is called Lever Right. He said, Lever Right? And I said, yeah, leave it right where you find it. It's no good. Don't pick it up. Just leave, leave it right there. And Rex caught on quick. Rex was a pretty sharp fellow, especially when it comes to money. Rex knew how to make some money now. And Rex went in the rock business, and we had a deal. I think we're selling rock for 50 cents a pound, and I told him I could get it for 25 cents for myself, but I'd take him to nap in. I took Rex to several nap in. He never heard of them. Got him used to them. And he'd sell that rock for 50 cents a pound, and when I wanted some, I would drive seven hours to Tennessee and load up 2,000 pounds from Rex and turn around the next day and drive home. Now, his was easy to load up because he already had it in a big power and had to walk up and down the creeks and rivers like I did in Texas. I mean, it was already in a big pile. Eventually, Rex was selling it for a dollar a pound. I paid him 50, and then he was selling it for two dollars and I was paying a dollar. But that worked out real good for both of us. I put him in the business. That was a deal we had, not too many people knew that. I know a lot of people wanna know how I could sell rock just as cheap as Rex if I wanted to and because uh, I wasn't picking it up myself. I just knew I was getting it somewhere. And I never said nothing about it. But uh When Rex died, his daughter called me that night. Said that they lost him in surgery at a blood clot. And uh, man, I couldn't believe that. Anyway, later on, I went up there to help Jerry Lee kind of get an idea what some of the stuff he had was worth. And he had some pretty much stuff that's unbelievable. And she told me and he told her, he said, if I ever die, something happens to me, don't you give John Tuttle this information. And she gave me that information, and I'm keeping that information myself to this day. And it has paid off big time. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Only problem with that information now is I'm too old to do anything about it. And I can't trust anybody. Because I've had a guy in Tennessee to screw me big time. I told him where he could get some some rock and I could get him on the place and we were gonna make a deal and I never heard from him. He changed his phone number. To this day he won't contact me. I don't know how to get a hold to him. But I do know he went on there and uh, got a lot of rock off of there. 
Another guy in Tennessee kind of did me like that. It's a shame you can't trust people, but you just can't. I had a guy in Texas screw me real bad. He said, if you'll take me to Arkansas, I was the first person to ever sell in the vacuum light. Mr. Wallace, Mr. Clovis up there, Wallace, what do you call him? He had a, a whetstone quarry. He quarried in the back of life for whetstone on his property. And uh, he was my best friend's best friend. Believe it or not, one of my best friends. And he introduced me to him. And I said, I'd like to sell it, sell it in the back of life. I said, nobody knows where to get it, where it's coming from, but they know points are made out of it, and I said, I could sell a lot of it. And he said, well, son, you can have all you want free. And I said, no, sir, I want to sell it. And as time went on, he would rent me his equipment. He would rent me his air compressor and backhoe and stuff like that. And I told several people about it. One person went in there for a long time after that, and uh, he couldn't get it as long as I was there, or I was around, and, and he didn't mess me up. Well, when I got out of the business, I told him I didn't care. I got out of business for a long time. So he went up there and started getting it in and selling it. And, uh, but one guy, before I got out of the business from Texas, he had a van, and he had bunk beds, had, had fixed where you could sleep in it. And he told me to take his nap in, I saw it in the back of right there. He said, if you'll take me with you and show me where and how you do that, he said, uh, I'll work my butt off just for a couple hundred pounds. I said, no, we'll split it up. So I took him with that... I think we got around a thousand pounds that day. He had to be back. We didn't have it two days. And we worked one day and had three days, drove up there a day, worked one day and then drove back. And uh So I was tickle paint, I had help. It was worth giving him that much rock. I thought he was a pretty good guy. Didn't really know that much about him, couldn't find out he wasn't no good. He was sorry, you know what, but one of the sorry people I've ever known in my life. And he's dead now. And uh, I hate to admit it, I didn't lose any sleep over when he died. But a couple years later, Ernest Parker took that quarry over. And I didn't know it, and he went up there and got with Ernest. And could talk to Ernest and listen it to him. And Ernest didn't know I was going up and getting no rock. Mr. Wallace was sick. And he leased him that whole quarry for one year. Nobody but him to get on it and get rock off of it. And that's about as dirty as you can get. So I called up there and asked to talk to Mr. Wallace. And they said he's not available. He was sick. and But his son-in-law was there. And I talked to uh, Mr. Robert Parker. And... Uh, he said, well, he had leased it to a guy in Texas. And I said, you got to be kidding me. And when he told me who, and I'm not going to talk about it today, I hope some of y'all will figure it out. And I said, oh, my gosh. I said, I am not believing that. I said, your father-in-law is my friend's best friend, and we're good friends. And I said, you need to go talk to him right now. And I said, he never would have done nothing like that. And he went and talked to his father-in-law, and his father-in-law said, no, indeed. He said, as soon as his lease is off, get him off of there. Tell him he'll never sit foot on my place again. And tell John I got another place that's just as good at the end of the road. It's not in the lease he has. So I was still able to go get my rod. Fortunately, he was never there when I went there, because I'm afraid something might have happened, and it wouldn't have been pretty. But that's why I don't tell nobody these secrets. You wouldn't believe where well, I know where some horse creeps at. And some of you might say, oh, I, think, I know, I know. No, you don't know. I promise you don't. This is on some private property that nobody's been on. I know they hadn't. They brought some here a while back and showed it to me and got off of it. Uh, 
And uh, it's just too much trouble for me. I can't pack it out of there. I can't drive no four-wheeler. And I'm not fooling with it. But because I have been screwed over so many times, I ain't telling nobody about it. And I hope nobody knows about it. The day I die, and it stays right there. I hate to say it, that's the way I feel about it. I mean, I have been dirty, dirty so many times in this business. It's not funny. <coughs> and I know that ain't the way the Lord wants me to be, and I'm not mad no more. The Lord's mad. But I don't forgive all that. I have a forgiving heart, but I ain't gonna tell nobody yet because I hate forgiving. When people do me like that, it's hard to do. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, I'm sitting here chit chatting, and I'm getting this thing there and there, and I ain't knocking off big plates like I normally do. And I don't know why I'm not doing that. I guess it's because I'm just trying to straighten the edges out. I'm thinking about trying to make something knocking off plates like that. I should have been doing it the whole time. I guess I... Anyway, I'm quitting on this one. You uh, know, what I'm going to make out of it. I might finish it tomorrow. Y'all have a blessed day.